Okay, so in this structure, let's try to see if we can devise a more accurate one than the last one that we've seen uh, from uh, motion compensated event features. And for that, let's review the problem of data association. Right? That this is an important one. This is actually one of the, the key ingredients that we mentioned in a couple of videos back at the beginning of tracking. If you remember it, it's uh, about saying uh, which balance to which edges belong to, right? So data association using events, it's a difficult problem uh, for multiple reasons. Um, one of them is that uh, even if the model we are trying to match, uh, it's uh, invariant to motion uh, to some degree, imagine such as the, the star shape that we were trying to use. Um, this was user defined and so it didn't depend on motion. Somebody wrote the draw this the star and then it's somehow invariant to some motions because uh, I mean the affines motions are also distortions um, and we only plot one star. We didn't plot the star for all possible uh, motions, right? Okay, so even if we have this model of the thing or the object that we want to track and it's motion invariant, um, events are not motion invariant because we know that events uh, highly depend on the direction of motion. Um, and we can see kind of if we plot a couple of uh, few events in a, in a space-time window, we collect them into these artificial uh, event frames and we see this is kind of the, the appearance of the window of events. Uh, if we move the camera uh, left, right, and we are seeing a checkerboard. So we only see, we only the event, events are mostly triggered by the vertical edges of the checkerboard, right? Okay, but uh, imagine that uh, we move a bit forward in time and now instead of moving it uh, left, right, we move it up, down. So at some point, uh, if we move it up, down, then uh, we now only see the horizontal edges. And at some point, there was a transition between this uh, uh, horizon when we were on the left we were looking at the vertical edges and then on the right we were uh, looking at the horizontal edges and it's very difficult uh, if we only have these events um, to, to say okay let's try to match and see these events on the left uh, to which events on the right uh, do they correspond it's, it's difficult because the appearance, at least from just by looking at these artificial event frames, even if you don't look at the artificial event frames, but you look at events in space time, they don't look the same, right? They may look the same for a very short time, but as time progresses, uh, these, these space time events, these windows of events, they, they change dramatically, such as here. Um, and on top of that, there is event noise, right? especially in low light conditions and uh, for fast motions. Then the challenge or the question is uh, how to track uh, well despite uh, all these nuisances, despite the mostly the, the dependence on the motion. That's a key challenge in tracking. And uh, well, a, pro a possible solution could be to match the events via some intermediate uh, motion invariant representation. What could this motion invariant representation be? Well, it could be uh, absolute intensity or grayscale image, right? It could be a frame. If we have a, a Davis sensor, for example, we could use the events and the frame. This is um, doable. Even if we don't have the Davis sensor, we could recreate these frames because we know we can kind of build them from image intensity reconstruction algorithms. And this is just an example of matching events across time, the, the images that i shown here, but uh, it applies uh, also to event to model matching that we have been um, investigating or studying using tracking algorithms. Okay, so the idea is to use some intermediate representation that it's more motion invariant than, than the events, right? So what have we seen so far? Um, what are the solutions that we've seen so far for data association? Well, we know that the event is associated to a model, a template, and we've seen the solution using using defined uh, models, such as stars, kernels, 
and these were like papers 2014-2015. Uh, the advantages are that they are properly, if properly defined, they can work well, which shows the potential of event cameras. The disadvantage is that they have limited uh, applicability, right? Because these kind of patterns, they may not be natural. So then how can we design more natural features? Well, we can, instead of maybe using user-defined uh, shapes or models, um, we could have events associated to models that are built from a short time windows of events. And that's what we have seen um, previously in the video in the, the work from, uh, from Zoo, uh, using motion compensated events to, to build uh, features. It was also done at, in this paper by PNBC. Uh, the advantages are that uh, it's not expensive. Motion compensation may not be expensive uh, compared to other algorithms. And it applies uh, to natural scenes, right? You can get events from natural scenes and build this template of features. The disadvantage uh, of this data association is that, you know, as because these templates are built from events and events depend on motion, they're eventually there is some drift there is the um, it will not be possible to match like horizontal edges to vertical edges in extreme case so and the the, the alternative is to associate events to a model that it's more motion invariant that it's uh, built from a template from a frame and we've seen some examples of this from Tedaldi and Kung and um, and now we will see another one, or that it's built from uh, this motion invariant representation, it's built from past events, right? So we don't need to rely on a different sensor. We can use the same event camera, but with more complex algorithms to recreate intensity frames and then use those to, to match uh, future events. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, this uh, solution maybe refresh ourselves um, the trackers that we have studied and so the last video was um, we seen this one these are basically using events events only to build motion compensated uh, event features that then are tracked using uh, expectation maximization icp so some soft data association and uh, registration of point sets using iterative closest point and then previously there were these uh, two papers and what they do is that they detect natural features on the frame and uh, then track them using the events only just using the events only so what uh, the problem with this one as we have seen is that there is a change in appearance that's the the problem or the challenge of data association and then eventually causes drift because these features are built from events. If the features are built from the frames, they may not be drift, but uh, if you're using point sets, maybe it's not so, uh, the edge trends, which is an important uh, um, property of, um, of edges and events, it's maybe not explicitly taken into account. So we will now see another algorithm called EKLT, so event-based, Canada's Lucas Tomasi tracker that um, it's building a feature representation um, from the frames so it doesn't it will not suffer from drift and it also considers the edge strain so before um, the kind of model that was built uh, from using the frames in, the, in these papers they were using like um, binary kind of models, right? There was an event, edge or no edge. And this will consider diverse uh, intensities of edges, like strengths of edges. Okay, so this EKLT, event-based Lucas, a Canada's Lucas Tomasi tracker, uh, in reference to a very famous tracker for classical images, which is called KLT. Um, the goal is the, to track features in the blank time between frames using the events, as you can see in this video. And the approach um, is that we will extract features on frames and track them using the events. Um, 
it will be asynchronously so the tracking so it has a low latency potential and it will basically convert these events into feature tracks as represented here at the bottom um, the approach that it follows it's a maximum likelihood one basically we will compare the events the data to a prediction of the events using an, the event generation model that we have seen in previous videos and this prediction of events will be done using uh, frame gradients and optical flow and it will do a joint estimation of both the optical flow and the feature warps um, before in the in the tracker um, the zoo was probably done uh, um, independently um, but now they are this is a joint optimization basically the goal is to obtain this these tracks from the events and the frames. Um, this is just an example to show that uh, imagine we have a scene acquired with Davis and uh, we acquire frames at one earth and we are going to track features here represented in green uh, on the events. And as you can see, uh, if, if some features disappear, then we, we can create new ones, right? This is not tracking a feature. Features are constantly being reinitialized. The good thing is that then we, we can combine uh, the events and frames to provide tracking, right? We don't need to acquire frames at 25 frames per second. We, we can do them at one earth. And then in the mean, in the, in the time in between, we can track using the events. So let's look a bit uh, in, in detail how the, the algorithm works. And let's look at it with this uh, very nice animation. So first we start by detecting uh, an edge pattern that we want to track and we do so in, a, in the frame, right? So this could be an uh, edge pattern around corner or it could be a distinctive edge pattern. In this case, it's kind of exaggerated like a big wheel, but it, it could be smaller. Um, we extract the feature in the frame and this feature will be tracked in space time using the events. So then imagine that sometime later we, we have tracked the feature until here um, and we have the, a volume of events uh, around the, the current location. So we have events in this spatial temporal window. What we do is that now we accumulate these events and we have seen how to create from this space time volume of events to create a brightness increment image. This is one of the representations that we have studied in the course. And this is nothing more than on every pixel we accumulate the polarity times maybe a contrast threshold C. That's what the formula is saying. Basically, gray says that there was no event. Bright means that there were positive events. Uh, and dark means there were negative events in that space-time volume. Okay, so this is the data that comes up, one that comes from the data, but we can also use the frames and some equations to devise a prediction of, for these events. How we do it? Well, we know that this measure brightness increment image uh, or patch, if we want to call it now, um, can be obtained by taking the temporal derivative of uh, brightness uh, multiplying by some delta t and using the constant brightness brightness constancy uh, equation, then basically we can work out here what is the temporal derivative in terms of the spatial derivative and the optical flow. This is something that we have studied before in the course using uh, the linearized event generation model. And basically it tells us that the brightness increment can be obtained by a gradient, a spatial gradient that it's moving uh, with velocity v uh, during a time delta t, and then this dot is the dot product. So we can take the frame, uh, compute the x and y derivatives, and that's kind of the first part, the gradient, and multiply dot product with uh, the displacement v delta t, that's uh, delta x, if we want to call it, and that gives us a prediction of the brightness increment, right? This prediction is computed from the frame, not from the events, it's computed from the frame. 
So then the algorithm will basically try to uh, match these two. We'll try to register two images. So we will obtain the transformation by uh, the, the tracking transformation by uh, registering this uh, brightness increment uh, images. So we have on the left uh, the predicted one, on the right the measured one, and now we uh, we say well let's assume some noise model and basically this is saying that we can frame it in a probabilistic way saying what is the probability of this space-time volume of events given um, the feature parameters p and the optical flow v and the frame l well we could say that it follows this uh, gaussian distribution and then if we want to maximize this uh, probability with respect to the red variables here, the, the feature parameters and the optical flow, well, then that's equivalent to minimizing the, the exponent. And by minimizing the exponent, basically it's minimizing the, the norm, the two norm between uh, the two uh, brightness increment images. And that's uh, the gist of, of this method, right? It's uh, from the events, creating these brightness increment images, from the frame, computing the, the a prediction of the events using the linearized uh, event generation model that also includes that the feature could have uh, rotated or translated, so there is a warp there. And then comparing these two by measuring their differences. And, uh, and then we have a, an optimization method. Could be this norm in the paper, uh, we use a different one because they normalize to get rid of the um, variable C. Uh, basically, you normalize each of these patches by their somehow norm or energy. In more detail, this is what uh, the two paths on the, so on the top path is when you have the events, they are integrated uh, the right feature location and that gives a brightness increment and how is the predicted brightness increment generated well this is just another way to put in a diagram the event generation model but you take the frame you compute the derivatives in x and y you warp them with the warp parameters you multiply by the dot product and that gives you the predicted brightness increment and now basically you will compare these two some error calculation and the goal is to um, estimate the, the warp parameters and the optical flow. These are the two unknowns. Here in this slide, there is a comparison uh, between uh, the proposed approach, which is this uh, bottom one, EKLT, and another method that we have studied in the course before, that it's uh, the one by Kuhn, that it's doing ICP with hard data association. Um, so on uh, on two different scenes, right? And it's showing, actually, the two methods are, one is this third column, and the other method is the fourth column. So the top row shows um, a scene with kind of uh, sparse events, so they are uh, at the edges of these simple shapes. And the bottom one presents more natural scenes where events are kind of uh, everywhere. There is not such clear edges. Um, basically, what we are doing in this figure is we are trying to plot uh, the objective functions that are being minimized in the second step of the um, of, of the tracking, the key ingredients, right? And one of them is um, minimizing some, in this case, weighted uh, uh, Euclidean distance between the two point sets, and the bottom one is minimizing kind of a two norm between these two image brightness increment images. And while these are uh, objective functions that live in different higher dimensional spaces, but if we just take two uh, of those parameters, uh, probably the X translation in both and, and plot this slice of the objective function, uh, what you can see is that um, just by looking at the landscape, um, 
it's a uh, better behave in the AKLT method than in, uh, in Kuhn. So there are many local minima. Uh, in this case, there is one, but there are also other ones. Um, more local minima using ICP with hard data associations than using the, the proposed approach of alignment of registration of uh, brightness increment images. And on the right is just a comparison of the two trackers, EKLT in blue, Kung et al, so ICP in, uh, in red with ground truth in green, that is not very visible because it's right behind the, the blue one. This is just basically to show that uh, you can argue why one method is better than the other, the associations, they show up also in the, in the objective function. Um, so not only the hard data associations, but also the type of objective function being measured. So in principle, if we have to say that we want to optimize something, we would rather optimize uh, functions that are smooth and have a clear minimum than functions that are not so smooth and have many local minima. Okay, let's look at some results. Uh, this is showing how to track uh, very fast motions in the blind time between frames until the features leave the field of view. So on the left, you see the type of motion, a fast motion. On the, on the right, you see features being tracked. They are initialized uh, in a frame that it's not motion blur, but then if we move very fast, um, the frames become blurred. And it's also comparing against the tracker from standard uh, classical images that is in, in magenta. This is just to show that uh, the tracker works uh, in, uh, it can, it's able to track uh, high speed motions. Uh, another scenario where the tracker works, it's in the high dynamic range scene. So feature can be tracked in both in very dark and very bright uh, parts of, the, of an image. So imagine you have this, uh, with a standard camera, you have a frame that it's overexposed, or you could have a frame that it's underexposed. So you, in this, on the on the left, you see the inside of the room, but you don't see the back. And um, on the right, you see the outside of the room, but no, you don't see the inside. You cannot find a single exposure time that will work well for for both. So what uh, the algorithm does is here, for example, using a, a frame that has been um, reconstructed using events so it's a high dynamic range frame uh, and you can also track features using the intensities provided by this frame so there is no need to use a frame from the database you could use uh, a frame that it's built from from events and then you're still able to track see features that are both in very bright and very dark areas and this is another sample to show that the tracker works also when you turn the lights on and off. So in low light conditions and in abrupt illumination changes. Okay, so the next question that we will see is how do trackers compare? 